This week on Roundtable. I write maybe every day, maybe not. It depends. There's so much weeping that happens. <laughs> Cecil Castellucci, Eisner-nominated author of Odd Duck and Shade the Changing Girl. Like the third person narration thing is that it gives it such grandeur mm -hmm. that I do wish it came back. James Tenney in the fourth, writer of Batman, Detective Comics, and co-writer of Batwoman Rebirth. When I'm when I'm stuck with it, like I I just tend to like go and get a massage, <laughs> like like one like one of the cheapo hole in the wall places, because it's just like okay, I can just lie in the dark and like get petted, <laughs> you know, yeah. for an hour <laughs> and just be like, I can't figure this out. Well, Someone be nice to me. <laughs> Marguerite Bennett, writer of DC Comics Bombshells and co-writer of Batwoman Rebirth. I want to do a really fucked up horror story. Like I want to do something that really scares people. So gentlemen, <laughs> how do we kill Superman? Oh, oh. oh wow. <laughs> That's a really good uh, segue into how do we kill Superman? I have this like theory that Superman is like um, the best thing for um, character, you know, because uh, he's got all the things that like every major iconic character have. And now that I'm on the spot, I'm, let's see if I can remember what they are. But um, uh, he has a superpower or a super skill, uh, uh, something that uh, he loves, um, uh, an, um, an enemy. Um, uh, oh God, there's one more. Uh, uh, a secret place and superpower. Something he loves. Anyway, there are five things. I can't remember what the other one is. But is it a superpowered dog? No, <laughs> no. But it's like, but it's like if you look at like every single character, they have, they have all of these same qualities that Superman has. And so whenever I do like writing, you know, classes, you know, um, have to speak because I do a lot of um, school visits and stuff. Like I always talk about how Superman. If you look at every other major iconic character, they have all the things that like Superman. Ha oh, weakness. That's the there other we thing. go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God, I got Solid. them all. Um, <laughs> but you know, but like every single major character has those kinds of things. So in, in a way, it is like sort of the cr the, the the sort of beginning of um, of uh, of writing in a way. You know, like when I'm dealing with kids and they're writing, it's like, okay, well, what are the what are the characteristics that all great characters have? And you can do it with anyone, with like Dorothy, with you know Harry Potter, like with anyone. So it's yeah. interesting. Anyway, oh. <laughs> good beginning. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Okay, I have a question too. Are you guys um, plotters, outliners, or are you pantsers? What? Pantser means you just like go by the seat of your pants, okay. which is okay. what I am. I was I'm just like something. Else. Yeah, no, I, I'm just yeah, no. yeah, like no, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe. I mean, uh, I don't that know. Where the a few is more, going? a few more of these, and maybe. <laughs> Um, oh, I don't. I don't like outlines. I just like like. I think the reason why I, I tend to write the end of my story at the beginning is because that way I at least know where I'm headed to, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. Um, so I don't outline at all. Um, but I'm so. But that's a plot. Like so. What what do you guys do? Do you guys actually plot out every issue, or you were talking I, about your the woods definitely evolved to the point where I no longer did big like you know, crazy documents that laid out every individual piece of it. Um, in Detective, I, I do that kind of more arc to arc. I will, like at the beginning of an arc, I will kind of pace out what's in it. And I will allow, like, like I was saying before, I'll allow the story to dictate itself in a new direction and then run it by people. Like I did the uh, Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, crossover uh, last year. And that had uh, originally had uh, a different uh, climax. And the, the, but then I was just chatting uh, with a few friends and one of them put the image in my head of, uh, you know, like what, like you should go with the Arkham villains and have them all turn into like the animal mutants. Of the, <laughs> and it was just like, oh, that, that's a thing yeah. that could only happen in this story <laughs> right, right. and is the absolute thing that needs to happen and so I had to reshift a few things because there was going to be a, a slightly different co uh, climax to the story and I, I kind of I shot uh, Jim Chadwick and Freddie Williams like my editor and my artists uh, you know what like this is what I want to do now and they were like yeah go for it like hopefully Nickelodeon's cool with it and <laughs> they were thankfully um, but uh, 
you know, because at that moment I needed to start planting seeds in previous issues, and sometimes you then have to go back and realign something in lettering or uh, mm -hmm. like to help set up the big conclusion. Uh, but that was the thing that added the like all of a sudden I needed to bring the turtle's mutagen into the world, and I had to be like, okay, where in this story could like a character come through and it's just like I had Casey Jones was gonna jump back into our world and it's like now he has to bring the mutagen with him. And so I had uh, like, and, and then the story kind of clicks in that way. And l like I said earlier, I like that kind of problem solving. I like, I like having an outline and then I'm very happy breaking it. So what does that document look like for you? Like do you do like, is it like when you do your arc thing, is it like, uh, uh, is it like, uh, okay, here's a document and it's got issue one, issue two, and like a little paragraph. Is it just like bullet points? It's what what is it? It's a, like imagine like a rambly email where I'm just like, what do you think if I did this? Oh God, I'm like, so glad because I think that's what I do. Yeah, no, it, it's very much like. And Marguerite, you've <laughs> seen some of these documents. I love these yeah, documents. it's like every couple of months since starting on Detective, I have sent Chris Conroy, my editor, a, what is, a, like I've copied and pasted them all into documents after, but I've sent him the equivalent of 10 to 15 page emails about oh, like, all right, like here are my ideas for everything. Like, okay, these are, you know, this storyline can dovetail into this storyline can dovetail into that. And some of them are like just like two paragraphs. And then I had like five paragraphs for what's going to end up being a, a two part storyline coming out this fall. Uh, that's gonna, but that was all because I'm bringing back the classic version of anarchy. And I wanted to create this kind of secret utopia under Gotham of, you know, uh, where uh, you know anarchy is kind of built a uh, anarcho syndicalist like mini like pseudo government down there. Uh, I love that, every word in that sentence. Yeah, yeah I no, know. It, I was like, it was like, like, and I love that that it's a utopia. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's it, like that's like the you yeah, know? exactly. It's it's sort of like. It's creating a kind of like a, what seems to be a good place, and then it has one bad element that then kind of shows why it's not quite aligned with Batman, which is always the thing with anarchy. But it's like I wanted to take the character anarchy, which also then ties into what we were talking about earlier, because I love being able to like like it's touching on some of the political reading I'm doing about like kind of leftist movements and the. Uh, in the early mid 20th century and how like and what anarchy really is and it's not the kind of like you know it's not just like Molotov cocktails and I'm gonna take down the right. government it's more like no it should be like a bunch of people who all decide what they they do rather than just like oligarchs deciding it. It's so funny when people say that like oh com like when they poo poo comics or at all because it's like there's some deep stuff that goes into like the actual thinking thinking of it. What do you do like a um, do you do like a, like a doc, what is your document? Look I have like? to outline, especially you know with bombshells where we have so many cast members, <laughs> where it's the kind of thing that I still remember. Like there was this one arc where uh, it wasn't a bombshells, fortunately. But there was one arc um, where I was like, you know, I'm just gonna kind of like follow this story where it takes me, and I lost track of a character. And I was like, well. <laughs> I'll never see that character again. <laughs> and it was like I needed her to show back up, but we hadn't seen her in ages, and like it, it just looked super shoehorned for me to remember that I'd forgotten about this cast member. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it's something that I, I do tr tend to outline pretty heavily. Um, but it is the kind of thing where it's, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely the freedom to to watch characters uh, sass you back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no, like that's that's one of my favorite moments. Um, yeah, and uh, gosh, um, and once I, I, I start honestly with the outline, and then uh, just sort of like, like, you know, I've got like the outline of the arc, and then just copy and paste, you know, what the first issue was, plug it into a document, and it's like, okay, what am I most excited about? And that's right. where I start. I don't start at the beginning. It's like, what, what scene in here is going to make me so enthused for this one issue that, you know, that, that, that passion for the project is going to overflow, um, you know, forward and backward uh, through the rest of the story. And um, so it's, it's definitely like, like eat dessert first is my, is my biggest piece of advice. How to have a bunch of end parentheses that then you can pull out at the last yeah. minute that then spread out. It's, it, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, problem that uh, I, like I always, I approach it from maybe the wrong angle. Like I, like I'm detective right now. There's a version of the detective uh, story in my head that will end at, you know, like each, like every couple of arcs, there's kind of a perfect like season ending mm -hmm. that I can, you know, I could turn that season ending into the the real ending of that wraps up everything 
that I've been trying to accomplish since the first issue of Detective. But there's also, in the back of my mind, the like potential plan where it's just like, okay, if I get, was given infinite room, like he, how do I keep this going and how do I keep building? And uh, and honestly, a lot of times those breakdowns of like, what would I do with another like 50 issues, uh, then I take ideas from all of those and stick them in the most, the, the next arc, like that way before I was, I would uh, actually have them play out because, you know, why save, right. uh, you know, don't be precious with yeah, it. Exactly. You want you want to give that the reader. Sense. If you have a really cool idea, you don't save it for a hypothetical two years from yeah, now. You right. save it for, you, you know, you give it to them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Don't hold that. Like, put all the best parts right now. Yeah. Because there will be more best parts. But I think it's hard to. Sometimes it's hard, like, you know, to like, you know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I'm like, I'll never have another idea. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. it's never gonna, and that's it, I'm, I'm tapped out, you know, like, um, so I get nervous, but I think, I think that is a great point that you have to, you have to, you have to put it all in there right away. And that, that's something that whenever I talk to, because at conventions, uh, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of fans that'll come up who have the idea for, you know, the one story they want to do, and, you know, and the the idea of even if it's not a superhero story, even if it's a you know a creator owned concept or something or whatever, it's something where they're just like, oh well, I couldn't get a seventy five issue like run on a book tomorrow, so uh, I'm gonna hold hold it off. And that's that's what I kind of say. Yeah. It's just like no, like if you have this like great world you're building in your head, tell a like thirty page like moment in that story that expresses it. Now take the all the cool bits and distill it down to the thing that makes you excited about it, and then send it out there in the world and then rely on the fact that you are going to have a better idea tomorrow. Like, cause you, yeah. like, you can't be precious. You always have to, like when I first started in comics, I was definitely a bit more precious. I definitely, you know, I held off on beats and I did that. And I think, you know, in some of my runs, you can sort of see the moments where I realize like, nope, this isn't working. That's like the, like holding it off three extra issues just left two kind of boring issues in the middle. Right. So. Like, why do that? Like, you should like just resolve that beat earlier and then it, get to the exciting part of the story. You always need to be flexible on, on your toes, especially in mainline uh, superheroes, because the next day you're gonna find out that like, oh, this character is, is actually moving over to this book or is doing that and do it. Like, you need to be able to, uh, you know, rework a concept in, in the, you know, in the face of corporate comics um, and Honestly, that that it's it's still part of the fun for me. It's like it, it leads to frustration sometimes, but uh, I like I like solving problems. Whenever I sit with writers, I always want to talk about um, like the actual butt in chair situation. <laughs> so can we can we talk about that? Like, are, um, do you guys like I write maybe every day, maybe not. It depends. There's so much weeping that happens, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but like, uh, how do you arrive to the page? Like, what, wh what do you, like, what do you write every single day? Do you write between a certain amount of, I mean, every writer has a different thing that they do. Like, I, I try to leave the page open. I, I feel like the page is open every day because it's not like as an artist you clock in and clock out. So I'm always like working out stuff, um, but like even today when we were sitting here, I got an idea for something. I was like, oh good, done, you know? But um, <laughs> but do you guys like have like a certain amount, like certain time that you write or what's your, what's your, what's your daily schedule? Oh, like I am not a write every day person and it's probably, it would probably be better if I were. Uh, I definitely, I do work every day. Yeah. I, set, I respond to emails. I like, you know, I think about story, I'll do that. But I also, like, I've just never been the sort of person that it's just like, okay, 10 a.m., I'm clocked in, I am going to write for the next two hours, then I'm gonna, like, go do a thing, then I'm going to come back and write for another. Like, I can't do that. I can't do that. Um, it is much more of a, like, and I'm also more of a sprinter. I, like, think, uh, I think through all of my stories. I tend to, 
like it's very rare that I will sit down starting to write an issue not knowing what's generally going to happen in the issue. So a lot of that kind of abstract space or like, you know, throwing ideas into documents or just like literally sitting and staring at a wall, like all of that's, you know, part of it. Um, but once I am sitting down and I need to work, then like I will all write somewhere, like I typically will write in like 10, 15 page chunks mm. at like in a go. Um, but that's because I've already pretty much blocked it out. Right, because um, you're working already. Yeah, right. I feel like that's kind of like what I do. It's like I'm, I'm working it always, but I don't do 10, 15 pages. It's like maybe <laughs> like maybe two pages. I feel like I'm sort of on the inversion because I do write every day, and I feel like it would be better if I didn't because at this point, like, I, I, have, a, I have a high risk of burnout. I mean, just the, the amount of books that I'm working on, and so just sort of like the, the not having any time to recharge between projects like does get to me after a while. Right. Um, and so it's the, the kind of thing, you know, even like if, you know, straight in the morning, I check my email, get up, and I've pushed the button on my audiobook, which is usually as, as a piece of research. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, I, like, my, my schedule can also be kind of erratic just with the number of responsibilities I've got, but it's the kind of thing that I try to work, start working at mid-morning. Um, and, you know, get down, it's the sort of like, like, eat dessert first. And it's like, what scene am I excited about? Okay, start there, and then work backwards and work forwards. Um, and then, yeah, I, I try to do, I try to do about 10 pages a day. Um, like, if I, if I go beyond that, it might be because I'm switching to a different project. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard for me to work, like, just on the one, like, all the way, you know, to completion. Um, without jumping around to something else, it's just sort of, you know, shot and chaser. <laughs> What are your strategies for writer's block? Because we all get writer's block. My strategy is to wash my hair or to do the dishes. Because I feel like it lets my brain sort of go to a dreamy place. Yeah, mindless repetitive tasks really help. Like, I've, <laughs> like when I've been at crisis, like the moments I've been the most stressed in the last five years, at every one of those moments, I have bought a very c complicated Lego figure <laughs> um, and just sat down and built it, like oh. in one night. Um, and like I just will... Like I'll just follow the instructions. I'll, like maybe I'll be playing some music, or I sometimes will just do it like all in silence, and I'll just like do it for five hours, um, and that will help realign me. But uh, honestly, for me, it's uh, what I'm always trying to chase is the flow of the story, mm -hmm. um, and there sometimes that it is it is brutal, like trying to get into that. Um, and uh, and you just have to just kind of hack at it and know that you can rewrite it all tomorrow if you need to, but just keep going. Uh, but for me, it's the like like the woods and detective. For, the way I write a lot of scenes is I will just write the dialogue flow. Um, I won't break it down into panels. I won't break it down into uh, even panel descriptions. Like I might say like, you know, he throws the glass against the wall or something like that. But there's a, like I will just sort of follow the flow of the conversations and just see where it goes because I know the general shape of the story and I know the characters at this point. That works the best with the woods where I can just sort of like, I can see, I know that the character's well enough to be like, okay, this character would pipe in here, this character would pipe in there, here's the core of the speech that needs to be made, this is how they would comment on it, and I will, I'll just, I'll try to like, like hook in and hopefully it'll just carry me all the way home because it's just like what, it's finding that moment where time stops meaning anything and then you look at the clock and three hours is, have passed mm -hmm. and you have a whole bunch of words on the page and there's like, you know, there's no surefire way to get on that. Some days it doesn't come. Like some days, you know, I'll, I just won't, you know, get a big chunk of work done. But yeah. But that's the thinking part. That's like that. That's like it's like a lot of writing. I think people forget a lot of writing is actually not writing. It's like yeah. thinking, you know, mm -hmm. percolating on yeah. it. Yeah, and it is the kind of thing where you know if you're if you're hitting writer's block, like it's the same thing where there's a point where it's like over exercising a muscle, and like at some point it's just going to be bone on bone. And you're just going to be doing damage to your story if you're going when you're burned out. If you're going right. when you're sick. But I do also want to caution folk from using, you know, oh, I just need to rest, just need to think about it, I just need to wait for inspiration because like that nothing's yeah. ever gonna be good yeah. enough. Then no. you're never, yeah, like, well, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like I always think of writing, it's like a document of where you were. Yeah. And at some point, you mm -hmm. just have to let it go. Yeah, you know? and you do sort of have to make an agreement with yourself, where it's like, okay, I'm going to take the next hour off. I'm going to take the like, you know, the next 24 hours off. But you know, but maybe you can switch over and work on something else, or like, you know, do do the chore, or whatever that you've been putting off. You know, something that is still productive towards your life and ideally towards your career uh, or your art, um, but not to the point that you are 
changing the story or progressing the story, but progressing it right into a like a hole, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, um, or or you know, trying to stretch it until it tears. When I'm when I'm stuck with it, like I I just tend to like go and get a massage, <laughs> like like one like one of the cheapo hole in the wall places, because it's just like okay, I can just lie in the dark and like get petted, <laughs> you know, yeah. for an hour and just be like, I can't figure this out. Well, Someone then, be nice to me. But it's the same thing because you're going to that dreamy place, right? Yeah, it's all uh-huh. about yeah. getting to that dreamy. No place. emails going yeah. off, you know, like like yeah. the kitty cats leaving me alone for two yeah. seconds, like you know. Yeah, can't they, see Twitter. Yeah, can't see Twitter. Can't see the the new notifications for you know. Oh, this new PDF just came in. Yeah. Um, it's just like the the suspended animation it's finally the time to be like okay yeah. if you're sitting in a dark theater what comes on the screen that would make you be like I'm gonna see that story yeah I love taking um, a little writing class and also part of my process I um, I take acting classes every once in a while oh, interesting. yeah just like little tiny workshops like um, like I've done Suzuki viewpoints and like Shakespeare you know speaking and um, uh, uh, just all kinds of little uh, Jungian uh, dream, you know, dropping in, like kind of <laughs> weird things. Because I feel like as a writer, like we're always just sitting around in our pajamas, you know, sort of, and, um, you know, creating character uh, in um, theater is the same as creating character when you're writing, except it's in your body. So, you know, so like, I don't like to, I mean, I'm not taking like long classes, but like a little weekend workshop or something right. like that, because I feel like it gets, it gets the words sort of off of my fingers and like into my core. And right. I feel like that then helps me to get back into my fingers. So I'm an audiobook addict. So it's like 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 wake up in the morning, I'm still in bed and I check my email and you know, see if anything's on fire and then as soon as like those fires are put out, <laughs> it's push play on whatever audiobook I'm listening to. Then it's, you know, get up, brush my teeth, wash my face, you know, like make coffee, make breakfast, you know, like like it used to be like walk the dog and literally tend the garden or whatever. And during that entire time for the first like hour to 2 hours of my day is just audiobooks. And so it might be a piece of fiction, it might be non-fiction, it might be um, like the audio or Audible has like these great courses that you know mm-hmm. you're supposed to listen to for an hour a day. And so it's just pulling all this stuff in. Um, and so, uh, so especially working um, with things like uh, like Bombshells, which is an alternate history, mm-hmm. or with Animosity, which deals so much with just just the you know biology and all the new things that we're learning about animal behavior, animal behavior and all the theories that we have about you know the effects of domestication on different species. Um, you know, I, I, I just don't have the time to just sit down and like. Like, you know, maybe dedicate or, or maybe I don't learn in the same way mm-hmm. where it's just the difference in reading. But like having someone explain it to me in this very conversational or friendly way um, is fantastic. And like that's that's the thing that I love. <laughs> like, yeah. I've been taking some um, Coursera classes, you know, the massive online college classes. And um, and uh, part partly I like when I take history classes because I feel like when I'm world building that like sometimes, you know, sort of having the scaffolding of like, World War II or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, is sort of interesting for world building when I'm creating new worlds. But it was really interesting because I, I wrote this Princess Leia novel and I was taking this class by happenstance called The Paradox of War. And it was about like the good and bad things of war and like what they bring, you know, the, the good things and bad things that they bring. And I was like, wow, this is curiously relevant to writing about, you know, um, the the empire and the rebels, you know, and um, so, yeah, but um, I love bringing that research in and I love that you listen to audiobooks. I never even thought of that <laughs> because, you know, I guess I'm dumb or something. Girl, girl. <laughs> but it's no. like, you know, it's like I just never thought like, oh, I could take a walk and listen instead of like, well, I clearly have to go to the library and read all these books. It's been very tricky. Like, um, like the, the the reason that that woman, you know, sort of has elected to, to dress up as a baseball player. The main thing that I want to do was was coming from uh, from Jackie Mitchell, um, who in the 30s, um, you know, you know, went out and tried out, you know, for for these major baseball leagues and uh, struck out Babe Ruth. Mm. And two days later, women were banned from mm. playing in national leagues. Mm-hmm. And it was just sort of like, that's. it, it sounds like I made that up mm-hmm. and I'm making some like, and she was 17 years old. It sounds like I'm making like some some sort of like mm-hmm. scolding point, but it's like, I, I, I didn't come up with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take issue with someone else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So that's why you put it in there. Yeah. Uh-huh. I no, it. I wanted I wanted yeah. her to draw inspiration from someone else who was told like you can't do this. Yeah. And you know, and just sort of like, watch me now, motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What do you do? You, do you pull in things from other places? Uh, for me, it's always been a bit more uh, media focused. Like I think I, it, like I sort of. Uh, try to exist in a genre a bit, especially when I'm developing something from the ground up. Like I, 
when I'm working on a horror uh, a horror story, I will I'll go into it and I will basically watch first I'll rewatch the like the the uh, the films and TV shows and short stories and novels that like that gave me a real love of the genre, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll go from there and uh, start and I'll start finding the things that are the closest to what I'm trying to do and see what they did and what doesn't quite work and what did work. Uh, right now, working on superhero stuff, I've been going back to a lot of, you know, because I'm, I have a fresh uh, memory of some of the more contemporary stuff, but when I was starting on the current run of Detective Comics, which is a, a team book with all of the Bat Family characters, I started back from the beginning of Chris Cl Claremont's uh, X-Men run, and I just started rereading all the way through, and it was really, really fascinating seeing the things that were uh, were used there, like story techniques and down to like third person narration and the way panel breakdowns would work uh, that still feel very vibrant and relevant today but aren't used so much because I feel like there was a moment that uh, they became a bit trite and people sort of put them put them in a box and put them away the same way that you you know you don't see uh, thought bubbles that much that in uh, mainstream comics anymore and uh, but like there are lots of different like the third person narration thing is that it gives it such grandeur mm -hmm. that I do wish it came back and it's like you can bring it back one of the major similarities that I'm hearing I mean like understandably that when you're doing a licensed character you do need to read you know like the work that deals with those characters backstories and their Absolutely. previous appearances but a lot of it seems to be like not just drawing from comics because if comics is all that you're reading then that's all you're being influenced by and right. so you just regurgitate what's already been created in your very tiny industry um, and so the influence yeah. you know from 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 movies or television or you know or nonfiction or just all of this you know definitely uh, seems like it's a much more you know something that, that truly enriches uh, the art that then you then produce when I write for DC I have to do full script but when I write my graphic novels I do open script and I have a discussion with that can we talk about script so yeah, no, no, yeah. please so um, tell me everything oh Lord <laughs> Oh goodness. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I, I know I'm a bit of a control freak, and so I, I definitely like block everything out, and I just cram my word documents full of reference images to the point that it's like, this is too large to be sent to your artist. No, damn. <laughs> so That's no. what hyperlinks uh, are for. I know. <laughs> but then, like, sometimes they don't get clicked, or it doesn't open, or it's gone by the time they get there, oh, and so yeah. You know what I do? Mm -hmm. I have a shared Pinterest with um, the artist and the colorist for Shade, and so Kelly and Marley and I have this um, Pinterest that um, that we started when we were first starting the book, so that we would um, be able to build a sort of shared visual vocabulary. Yeah. So, um, so I, I suggest Pinterest. I guess Bombshells is sort of a universe in and of itself, and is sort of like like uh, the same variation on superheroes right. um, you know again since it's an entire world even though we just have one title mm -hmm. um, and so with uh, with bombshells um, which is a, a, an alternate history World War II where all the superheroines came first for anyone who was unfamiliar with it um, it uh, it comes out in these 10 page chapter uh, weekly installments and so for every single chapter when we started out uh, it focuses on a different heroine and I wanted to round out the world completely so it wasn't just a single genre as though like there's only there's only one tone to the world it was like no um, so uh, so Batwoman was our was our lead character and so she's the sort of like cheesy 1940s like adventure reel <laughs> radio reel um, and then Wonder Woman is a war story and Supergirl is a propaganda film and Zatanna is this like black and white universal horror movie and Aqua is a romance and you know so we were able to just sort of define um, each one uh, with, with its with its own with its own tone um, and uh, from there uh, the, the the writing and the dialogue and everything um, was was very focused on like okay so so you know it's each of one of these are our separate genre stories and then they eventually like wind up merging together but I think that like as far as the actual script writing it's still like super basic for me and I, I still script out like full dialogue and everything and just pile like stuff with like okay you know here's her backstory it's not gonna come up yet but just just so you know uh -huh. um, yeah and I, uh, I like before beginning anything um, to get on Skype with the artist and sort of like find find out, um, you know, what, what do you want me to share with you? You know, like, like what, what do you want from this story? What would make you happiest? What do you never want me to send you? How do you feel? How many panels a page are you, do you like? Uh, oh, how are double page spreads? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the kind of thing, like, I, uh, 
It's like that story from when they were making Lord of the Rings. And uh, in order to get some of the characters, um, you know, to, to truly, like, the, 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 the people that they were portraying, um, like, with Eowyn, like, he had, like, embroidered special, like, Norse underwear <laughs> made for her. And it's like, <laughs> maybe don't spend a ton of time embroidering the underwear that no one's going to see. Like, I'm sure it gets a great performance, but there is a certain level at which you sort of have to cut yourself off as far as, like, how much, how far down the rabbit hole am, am I going to go for something that the artist may not want and something that may not necessarily translate or enrich the story, that I've just now spent a ton of resources that I could be spending on editing, on dialogue, on something else. Um, so yeah, a lot of it just comes down to the communication with the artist beforehand um, and figuring out how I can tailor uh, both the story and the execution of the script to what they want to get from me. Like, when, when am I just overwhelming them and make, like, turning them off to the project completely? Um, and <laughs> when am I, you know, like, giving them something that is uh, especially made for them? And like, I feel like, you know, when, when you're happiest, you're gonna make your best art. <laughs> Is there like a dream thing that you'd like to do in any of um, your books that you're working on right now that you haven't been able to do yet, but like you're like, oh, I'm poised to, to do it? I really, like honestly, it's one of those things where it, it's, it's stepping a bit o further <laughs> o o away from queerness, but I wanna do a really fucked up horror story. Like, I wanna do something that really scares people. Like, because I think, Horror is, uh, it's its the genre I'm, like I, my two favorite genres are like young adult fiction and like really like dark nihilist horror. Like, so it's like, I'm a weird person. Um, but the- Humility man. Yeah. Uh, and by weird you mean awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, horror and comedy are kind of like two sides of the same coin. And, you know, I, I can do like little funny moments and stuff, but I'm not a comedian. But I do think that, you know, I have a bit of an eye for horror. I, I did my like, you know, senior thesis on horror in college and uh, international horror cinema. And it was a like, honestly, being able to add something into that mythos, being able to be the first person who kind of takes a, uh, takes the horror lens towards a cultural fear is something that I want to do and like but that first you need the insight you know and I'm very proud I, I've done these series of apocalypse stories uh, mimetic cognetic and then a third one that's not announced yet but like mimetic like I was very proud of because it was kind of it was about the fear of the spread of information and the fact that we are reaching towards being a society where an idea can spread faster than we know whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, and then if you actually weaponize that and make it destruct destructive, it can be uh, you know, a really, really horrifying force and could destabilize the entire world. Um, like if everyone who looked at the internet one day died that day, it would destroy the entire world. <laughs> like so, I don't know that it's that it's being it's playing in those worlds that you know I I've done I've dabbled in it, um, but I there like I feel like there's a big horror story that's brewing in the back of my mind that I you know hasn't quite taken shape yet. Can I just say that like, you know, you keep talking about young adult things and I know we were talking earlier like um, outside like about, you know, I think you ha please write a young adult book or a middle grade book yeah. because I th you are that is you just you are already that and you just need to do it. Yeah, no, yeah. I, w I would also love like that yeah. that's the other thing I really desperately want to do. I yeah. like I, you know, I'm just getting started. Like I, you know, I. Yes, I've we're been, all just getting started. <laughs> I, I'm very, you know, there are lots of stories I want to tell. Mm -hmm. so. What about you? Is there anything <sighs> like specific that, like, you know, um, like especially maybe with queer stuff that, like, you're like, I absolutely want to, you know, g get this story out there. Or? I mean, I'm horribly spoiled. I just want to like say that I'm fully aware of it because like I got to write Angela Queen of Hell and had like this this wonderful lesbian romance like like you know Orpheus and Eurydice and then they had um I mean like with Bombshells it's this wonderful merging of oh I have a completely queer cast with like this alternate history World War Two and with Animosity you know like I, I just get to have so much fun and I've got my creator owned and I'm writing Batwoman who's my favorite superhero right. whenever um, and then like and I did Insects was which was this like foray into like feminist body horror 
Um, and so it was just, I, you know, I've been, I've been very, very fortunate and I'm very, very grateful for the readership especially that let me tell those stories and let them find an audience. And um, I'm actually like the, the, the latest excursion is into prose. I'm working on a horror novel right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's like, which is about like a, a like a queer documentarian who like gets in this fucked up situation. Um, and so uh, like that's definitely it's the same thing where horror has been like one of the major things that like I just come back to over and over and over again. And it's the thing that I can talk about for hours. Mm. <laughs> and it's the thing that makes me happiest to dissect or like the movies to watch or the the stories to watch and to analyze. You know why this particular thing evokes a fear. You know, like what separates a horror that you know, like, like gives you, you know, either an adrenaline rush or like, you know, it creates a moment of catharsis. Like the same thing, the relationship between horror and comedy. Um, you know, what are the different uh, horrors? You know, based by culture, based by nation, based by the political climate going on in each nation at that time. You know, what, how much of it is is the influence of your culture? How much is it is your individual fear? Um, I mean, all of these things. You know, just like I. Like honestly, like if I if I like had a gun to my head and it was like you have to pick a new career tomorrow, it would just be I'd just go into something where it's like you know analyzing horror, writing about horror <laughs> for a living. I've always been fascinated by um, uh, uh, like um, uh, the westerns and like you know the idea of sort of exploration and settling and stuff. And yeah. I, like I don't necessarily want to write like a, a typical like American western where we yeah. like go and whatever, but like I like the idea of like sort of western in the stars, you know, like, you know, sort of moving. New frontier. Yeah, new kind frontiers of, yeah. kind of thing. Like that has always been the thing. But for me, I mean, my voice has always been young adult, like, because what I love so much about young adult, I mean, talk about horror, you've got body horror, like you know, things erupting <laughs> and yeah, everywhere, you know, like and, 12 years old. and everything is the end of the world, you know, it's like, um, you know, like you just feel like you're walking around with no skin on, and um, and I just feel like it's like it's that moment where a character, a person, um, throws down to figure out what kind of a human being they want to be. Like, do they want to be good? Do they want to be bad? And they're experiencing everything for the first time. And I don't ever feel like that actually changes. Like in life, it's not like you get out of adolescence and then you're like, "Yep, I don't have any problems anymore." It's like there's fucked up shit. Yeah. And like you know, weird high school lunch groups like still yeah. in adulthood. And it's understanding that we're one part of such an elaborate storytelling team. That this is not a solo endeavor. This isn't writing a novel. And even writing a novel at some point is taking it out of your hand and, and it's putting you know into the publisher and you and know to the editor, yeah. Uh -huh. And so with this, it's, you know, we're just the start, you know, and not even the start in some cases of a chain where it's, you know, like, you know, it's it's the editor and, you know, like comes to you with the prompt, we need this project. And then you write the script, it goes to the penciler, then it goes to the anchor, then it goes to the color, then it goes to the letterer. And then, you know, then it goes to, to all the proofreaders and all of the people of the higher up to make the decisions and it comes back down. It's just sort of like you are, you are one part of something that's much, a community that is much larger than you and a team that is much larger than you. I think some young writers have a hard time grasping at the very beginning is the idea that a script is not a piece of work. That is not, it is not a final product. Yeah. It is not a thing that goes out into the world. It's not a, it's not a thing that exists for any reason other than being a production step in the process of mm -hmm. creating a comic. Um, and like I remember uh, when I was in high school, I, th I think I was reading an interview with Neil Gaiman who described it as it's writing a letter to an artist. Mm -hmm. And it's not, a, it, like it is yeah. nothing. It is nothing more than that. All you were trying to do is to is to get the artist to express the story that you're both excited about, mm -hmm. and it, to help them along that road. And if you aren't working in tandem, and if you don't have the right support system or anything, if, and if you're too precious, once again, if, mm -hmm. if you are precious about any of it, and if you like if you have this kind of ego where you think that your contribution is more important than anyone else's, then you aren't going to end up with a good comic. Mm -hmm. yep. You better damn well believe that the words that you put on the page that go to the artist might not be the same words that end up in the comic book yeah. because a lot of times like, like with Soupy Leaves Home, like once I saw the art, I was like, oh, we don't need any of these words. We can just throw them all out. Or like I can adjust what I've written in the caption because 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 I, now I can take it to a new level. So it's like you can't be like, well, this is my masterpiece and therefore all my words are gold. It's not like a play where like you can't, yeah. no one, you know, no one's allowed to like change any of the words. It's like. No, you better change the words. Absolutely. Yeah. It's organic and it has to be able to be flexible. And that's the kind of thing where, you know, even though you may be, you know, early on uh, in the, the thing that gets this entire thing moving, you also have the ability to create the most harm in some ways. Because, mm -hmm. like, if you are late, that means every other person yep. in that chain doesn't get to pay rent this month. 
And so it's like, you gotta get your shit together. That's right, you're a responsible <laughs> mama. You yeah. gotta like, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, yeah. you gotta do it. Which comes back down into, you know, not being precious with it, with understanding that with serialized storytelling, whether it's the best issue you've ever written or the worst issue you've ever written, you have another issue due next month. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah. like, like these things are not eternal. Um, you know, that like, you know, ideally you make a work that, you know, means a ton to, to, to different people and to different readers and lasts in, you know, in the, their consciousness. Um, but that there's always got to be something else coming that you cannot rest on your laurels. You have to stay hungry and you have to stay excited. Yeah. And that is my favorite part of this job, honestly. Yeah. To, to being hungry and excited about our work. Cheers.